I, I first spoke to Vivian Redding in January 2012, which seems so long ago now, at the launch event in Brussels, announcing her major new initiative, which was a massive and groundbreaking piece of European data regulation um, that would become GDPR. A year later, I interviewed her at length just after the Snowden story had broken when she was in Dublin while Ireland held the EU presidency. And I remember um, so clearly her enthusiasm and vigor and her courageous clear grasp of the need for protective legislation that could take on the corporate and government um, forces that were seeking access to personal data, something that I think many people did not at that time fully understand as a highly valuable but alarmingly exploitable commodity. And Vivian began her distinguished working career, as I am pleased to say, a journalist in Luxembourg before entering politics, initially as a member of the parliament in Luxembourg, before election to the European Parliament. And in Europe, as we know, she served in a number of roles um, as commissioner, including vice president and European commissioner for justice, fundamental rights and citizenship. And in that latter role, she shaped and championed the GDPR and was a stalwart in defending many of the areas we now think of as central to GDPR, but which were under extreme pressure to be watered down during the long pre process of hammering out the final um, iteration of what we can now clearly understand as a globally influential and important law, and indeed one that which has now begun to shape other nations' laws. Today, she's once again a Luxembourg parliamentarian and also sits on advisory and, and company boards in areas of digitalization and technology. And she's also a board member of foundations that are engaged in geopolitics, societal and legal affairs. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Redding and a talk which I know all of us are very much looking forward to. Please, Ms. Redding. Thank you so much for this uh, very kind uh, introduction and for the memories of uh, where it all started. But I just would like to recall why it started. Now, Europe is built on values. It's not built on um, getting uh, enlarged by war, but uh, nations freely give up a part of their sovereignty in order to join the European uh, Union. Um, this idea comes out of the Second World War after an experience with millions of death and uh, non-rights uh, all over the place, and uh, nations said uh, never more. And so the European construction started then step by step. It started with economy in a very realistic way. Uh, in 1957 with the Rome Treaty, Coal and steel were put together in order not to allow any more a traditional war to be led. And at that moment, it was interesting. The citizen um, was not really present in this construction. It were only the workers uh, linked to uh, the economy. And uh, it needed the single market to be established before there was a free movement for goods people and services. So um, uh, the, in the year 2000, uh, we see putting the rule of law in the center of the European construction. Um, it became very clear uh, that you could not any do more do bits and pieces only linked to the economy, but you had the citizens to be taken on board. And it is interesting to see that as well the Treaty of Lisbon as the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is our Bill of Rights, uh, that they both foresee specifically the right of the individual to its own personal data. Why is this so? Well, you must know, as I have already said, many of our member states uh, were coming out of uh, wars other who um, joined later out of totalitarian regimes, left communism or right dictatorships. And they all had this uh, collective memory of mass surveillance, of distrust 
how governments uh, treat our data. And that led to the 1995 Data Privacy uh, Directive. But a directive, as specialists know, is always a patchwork because if government can apply that the way it wants, uh, it was 1995 also uh, was in the digital stone age. Uh, so uh, the rules were adapted to uh, um, not at all uh, to uh, what the digital age would become. And uh, it was also very clear, and I quote from um, uh, the 2011, where a poll showed that 70% of Europeans were concerned that their personal data held by companies could be used for a purpose other than which, uh, for which it was collected. So it was at that moment not anymore uh, the uh, surveillance of governments, it was also the misuse of data by companies, and it was the uh, European uh, basic law, the constitutional obligation, which uh, brought me to the reflection that um, uh, it was not if I would do something, but I had to make a legal action and not tomorrow, but at once. Uh, and at that time, I uh, turned to a, a recipes I, I had known from my time as commissioner uh, for telecoms. Um, uh, don't make directives, which then uh, lead to uh, piece mills, and, um, but uh, go to um, uh, one rule for one continent applying to every body. Uh, no more balkanization, no more 28 different regimes, but one system for all, because that will be not only an engine for growth in the digital economy, but also uh, the basis for um, trust of the people in their leadership and in the economy. So that is a famous January um, 2012, uh, which was already uh, mentioned. I proposed then uh, this uh, regulation, one continent, one rule, free movement for data under the uh, authorization for operating on the whole single market. So uh, also very important for startups who did not uh, need any more to ask uh, authorizations for operating in different constituencies, but one authorization permitted them to utilize the whole of the uh, continent. And then rules applying to all persons, not only uh, residents, but also visitors. That means Americans uh, in holidays, in Europe, uh, they are protected by the Europe uh, data protection uh, rules. And to all companies also, uh, wherever their um, uh, establishment um, is, they have to have a European establishment, but their mother house can be anywhere in the world. Um, on, if they operate on our territory, our rules apply. Um, uh, also for the third uh, country web industries, and that brought also about the extraterritoriality uh, of uh, the rules. So it was a very historic act by which uh, uh, Europe wanted to seize its digital um, future. Um, but before it would become better, it became worse um, because everybody was against. Uh, most of all, our American uh, partners who quickly sent over 80, I still remember, high-level uh, um, uh, uh, specialists in order to make one of the biggest lobbying campaigns uh, Europe has ever uh, seen. It was uh, quite impressive. There are even uh, feature films uh, made about this, and um, so the cinema has taken up this moment because it was it was a, a lobby war, um, which uh, worked out, as you know, um, uh, they should have invested uh, the money into changing the system that would have been more efficient because they lost the money uh, in uh, lobbying without a result. And then, um, because there where the lobbying worked, that was in with the governments. Uh, 
the governments uh, being uh, less uh, open uh, than, for instance, the European Parliament and the governments being one of uh, the decision maker on law, um, there was a lot of reluctance uh, still. And then came Snowden with his revelations about um, prison uh, legislation and the way NSA, National Security Agency, uh, could seize all the data uh, of uh, American companies wherever those American companies were also in Europe. It was a shock, it was a wake-up call, and then things went very, very quickly. Um, in the beginning, there were 4,000 amendments in the European Parliament, after Snowden, there were 621 votes yes and 10 votes no, which really shows that um, Snowden has um, made that the European GDPR could live. Uh, but it didn't go as quickly as that because you know that uh, European legislation takes a lot of time. There has to be uh, an agreement between the lawmakers, the lawmakers being at one side the governments and at the other side the uh, directly elected members of European uh, Parliament. Uh, so it took some more years and I go quickly over that because uh, um, it was very uh, complicated. Uh, um, but um, uh, there was a very resourceful rapporteur in the European Parliament also, uh, Jan Albrecht, uh, pragmatically green. Um, and um, in the end, uh, the agreement was found because uh, they we were tying up GDPR with PNR, and that made that the reluctant uh, governments uh, still then uh, came in. And so an institutional tug of war finished and um, GDPR uh, became law. It became law, but with two years to be applied. That means all those governments uh, who in 2018 said, oh, what a surprise that now we have to apply GDPR. Since 2012, they were sitting in the meetings. They co-decided about the legislation, and when the legislation was finished, they were given two years in order to apply it uh, uh, in, in the hands of their uh, independent uh, regulators. Um, GDPR is for me uh, the symbol of how Europe uh, can, if it brings its ends together, uh, really uh, become uh, the leader uh, on, uh, on um, seeing and organizing uh, the world. Because you see Europe's third way uh, between uh, a very commercial US and a very total control uh, China um, uh, was introduced also in the trade agreements of Europe. Uh, so um, that those who wanted really to trade with Europe had an advantage to adopt uh, part of our uh, regulation. And that is the extraterritorial uh, impact also. Uh, it is not negotiable in trade agreements and there are very rare adequacy uh, decisions. And I would like to say you very clearly, an adequacy decision, which means we consider that an um, other state has a similar um, protection of personal data than Europe, and then we recognize it as equal. Such adequacy decisions are purely commission decisions, and they are given as long as the situation is clear. The commission also can take back such a decision. It has given very few in uh, the past, and it is negotiating some in this moment, but also very few. Now, the question is, of course, how did uh, GDPR apply? Well, it was not an easy thing to apply uh, such um, um, uh, a system, uh, which goes gives a lot of rights to the individuals. And um, many, uh, many regulators um, in the beginning uh, were 
learning by doing, I must say, uh, not very well prepared. And uh, they allowed a certain tolerance period. But I am sorry to say they allowed the tolerance period to the big companies. And they were sometimes very heavy on uh, small organizations and on small uh, uh, companies. Uh, but that's uh, the past, let's uh, forget it, because as from 1920 uh, on, the national regulators started to impose uh, solid fines for solid misbehaving. Um, it was uh, 840 uh, fines for a, uh, an enormous amount uh, of uh, money. And uh, I would like to uh, quote the umbrella organization of, uh, of uh, in the EDS, which says we have come as a, through a three year old who must still learn to walk before it runs. Well, some of us thought uh, it was uh, time to move. And uh, so the critics against uh, the regulators, only looking to the nitty gritty and not looking to the big uh, um, uh, companies who really were massively uh, mistreating uh, the data of the individuals became more and more uh, vocal. Um, I must say, fortunately, the wind has turned with major fines now for serious misdoings of important companies uh, coming out. And uh, well, I am. I have to say also as a Luxemburger, it was the uh, very unlikely Luxemburger uh, regulator um, uh, who moved uh, in, in the most solid way. Uh, but after having been pushed a lot, I must say, uh, by uh, the civil society uh, and uh, by critics uh, in the world press, uh, the latest Amazon fine of 746 million um, Luxembourg emerged as a privacy uh, champion, and uh, this um, was due to the mishandling of personal information, mostly for targeted advertisement. But uh, to, to tell you how it went, because still in February this year, Luxembourg's regulator declared it would not act. But the critics then became so strong, uh, it had to act. And it did act massively, which is a good thing. Because why is it a good thing? Because it put pressure, for instance, on Ireland. Um, Ireland, who has a lion's share of the Silicon Valley and Chinese uh, companies. And Ireland, as you know, um, did not uh, uh, act at all. Um, it was, uh, uh, it is faced with 165 significant complaints, not speaking about the smaller ones, and only 2% have been uh, resolved. Um, and just to quote the Quadrature du uh, Net, um, whose complaint, by the way, uh, led to the Luxembourg Amazon fine, they say, this historic sanction highlights even more the complete abdiction of the Irish Data Protection Authority, which in three years has not been able to wrap up any of the four complaints we brought against Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, and Google, unquote. So end of this story and end of this pressure, the Irish data watchdog had to move. And it moved with the WhatsApp a decision, a 225 uh, million uh, fine. Um, and what is interesting uh, to say as well for Luxembourg than for Ireland, um, their decisions were not lone ones. Uh, they were submitted uh, to the other uh, regulators to have a look at that. And they got the okay from, okay from a majority uh, of uh, regulators. And um, just to make the picture complete, other cases will follow. Uh, TikTok has already been uh, fined 750,000 um, by uh, the Dutch regulator. Um, the uh, company having moved its headquarters to Dublin in December 2020, the uh, DPG launched uh, two inquiries uh, relation, in relation to child uh, personal data and to the transfer of data uh, by China. 
so uh, very clearly um, uh, we are moving uh, to a position where the regulators take their responsibility and that is good so for the future because GDPR personal data is a first step in order to make the digital world possible but we are moving into the AI world and uh, you know also that we are working on uh, AI uh, ethical regulations and it will be very important that we do not go a step back but that we try also in AI to have an equilibrium uh, between uh, protection, protection which leads to trust and the possibility to uh, leave go uh, the innovation uh, into positive uh, constructions. And that is also one of the reasons, and I link that also to uh, GDPR, um, if there are uh, states uh, around the world saying that uh, they do not want human control of algorithms, I start to be scared. And one of the states saying that, as you certainly know, is the UK. And that simply uh, cannot be, because um, in the European way of thinking, it is still the human being who is the center of all action and not uh, the biased algorithms. Uh, that brings me then uh, to several members, several countries, uh, former member states, and other world players, and looking at how they are linked to the GDPR. Um, uh, it is very clear, and I said it already, that uh, the adequacy uh, decisions are rare. Um, they have been given in the case of Canada, Andorra, Argentina, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Switzerland, just to quote uh, some important ones. The procedure with South Korea uh, has been launched in June. It is ongoing. And also in June, um, two decisions concerning the UK, GDPR and Law Enforcement Directive were adopted. Well, in the case of, uh, of, of uh, Great Britain, it was an easy one uh, because Great Britain was a European member state and it applied uh, GDPR. Um, so to make given adequacy to Great Britain was normal. Um, the question is, uh, where will go? Uh, where will Great Britain go from uh, now on? Because, as I said already in the beginning, uh, G an, an adequacy decision is a decision taken by the Commission and taken back by the Commission if the situation uh, should uh, change. So, um, whatever might be. Um, the, if there are movements in uh, the UK, and there are those in August, the government has announced its intention to build data partnerships with the US, Australia, South Korea, hoping to loosen the rules on data transfers uh, in order to boost trade and innovation. And the idea is to make uh, data enable trade easier and cheaper. And the UK estimates that these are, are um, uh, 11 billion pounds uh, worth movements. Um, all right, it's interesting to see um, that despite the latest backlash, the UK once more insists on liberalizing health data, giving as an example to follow the NHS Xs national database of x-rays and images taken from hospital patients um, for all those wanting to investigate uh, COVID-19. So there are interesting movements uh, going on. Um, Europe is going to observe this. Uh, I don't think that Europe is going to uh, react on declarations, but Europe is going to react certainly on actions. And that brings me then uh, to the United States, because the United States are also like um, the uh, Great Britain, a third country, not 
a European Union country. And um, there is no adequacy because between the United States and uh, Europe, um, because simply uh, the US has no corresponding privacy rules in place. And in order to allow, nevertheless, a smooth exchange of data between the two continents, specific agreements have been elaborated. You remember safe harbor, you remember privacy child, child, shield, both have been eliminated by a ruling of the European Court of Justice um, on basis that there is insufficient safety guarantees for citizens, for European citizens, um, linked to the power of US agencies uh, concerning the access to European data in US companies abroad. Um, which puts those US companies in a very uncomfortable position because they are sometimes, they are often, they are most of the time, between two conflicting uh, rules. Um, the American which says one thing, the European which says another thing, and so which one to choose. And I think the case of Microsoft here is absolutely uh, interesting um, because uh, um, there was a question whether a court in the US can issue a warrant that uh, compels a US-based provider of email services, Microsoft, to disclose data stored outside the United States. And here I would like to come uh, to the case in the Supreme Court of the United States, where uh, a group of uh, parliamentarians um, representing their political groups, major political groups, um, uh, made an uh, amici curiae uh, brief uh, to the Supreme Court. And I just would like to quote out of this because it makes it very clear and understandable what is the problem. EU rules recognize that every EU data subject has a fundamental right to the protection of their personal data, as well as a fundamental right to the confidentiality of their communication. Under EU law, those rights are not diminished when a data subject entrusts their data to service providers, including the US service provider like Microsoft. And another quote, the restoration of the warrant would render null the provisions of a series of international agreements, sanction the infringement of the fundamental rights of EU citizens, place Microsoft in breach of its legal obligation under EU law. It would reinforce the already strong sentiment of many EU citizens that their data is not safe when they lose IT services offered by US companies. So there we are. After not having any more um, an agreement to allow the free flow of data, there was a complete standstill under the Trump area and the new Biden administration um, talks are starting again. And you know that there will be the EU US Trade Tech Council in September 29, 2030s. Interesting to see that on the EU side, it is Vestager, Digital Affairs and Dombrovsky's Economic Affairs who participate. And um, uh, really it will be important to rebuild trust, not only at economic level, but also at digital uh, uh, level. Not only after the Trump area, but also after the Afghanistan uh, debacle. I think that the geopolitical plans for transatlantic cooperation based on based joint rules are absolutely uh, essential because the current data flow system is at a breaking point. Uh, regulators, I quoted already some uh, big cases, but for instance, Hamburg's data authority um, uh, wants uh, the German officials to uh, stop to use Zoom. Uh, France goes after Microsoft, Portugal goes out uh, after uh, Cloudfare. Hundreds of complaints um, uh, are on the desks of the watchdogs. So pressure builds up and it is not sure that many of those are going to come to court 
report and it's going to be a catastrophe in the transatlantic data flows. I know that there are the standard contractual clauses, but here there are also growing legal challenges and they could also uh, be scrapped. So for me, there is only one solution and that is a new uh, data deal. And I know how difficult this is because of uh, an unequal mentality. Um, America thinks surveillance, Europe thinks privacy. And so far there are no proposals on the desk of the US uh, um, federal uh, government. There is no uh, work being done for a federal privacy uh, bill. Um, Congress has not organized any hearings I know that there are many bills. I know that there are some states, California and uh, Colorado, Virginia in the making, uh, but they have not implemented a right to sue for citizens. So no national standard in the doing and no independent regulator in the doing. That will lead many companies to keep data in Europe. And that will not be the ideal solution. Most of all because other continents are moving and uh, I cannot do otherwise than uh, um, come uh, to uh, China because I think that's interesting that um, the country which we had would have last supposed uh, to move is now uh, moving, um, uh, putting data protection uh, rules in the forefront. Um, uh, uh, most of it has been copied on GDPR, um, but of course these rules only concern the private sector and they have an extraterritorial effect also, um, but they are very, very discreet on the public sector and on the state uh, organs, uh, many loopholes um, uh, uh, or exp expressed less diplomatically a massive security carve out. Uh, so it is a GDPR um, uh, only for some, uh, but you have to put that in, uh, in, in connection also with the recommendation uh, to uh, with uh, the cracking down of recommendation uh, algorithms. You have to put it into um, uh, co uh, in, into uh, relation uh, with this the safeguard national security and social public interest. Um, question uh, where the only uh, algorithms accepted are those which promote the ideology of the Chinese uh, state. Um, uh, it, it is and it, uh, the, the governmental attacks on Tencent, Didi, uh, doxing. I mean, things are really going on in China and add to this that China is massively investing into the cloud and it dominates the cloud, um, uh, that it massively invests in quantum computing patents. It's the biggest uh, patent holder uh, in the world. And it is moving internationally. Look at the digital Silk Road, where through the infrastructure, there is a push and pull factor for growing influence in data governance. That brings me to a very simple conclusion. We have an interest in the West to join forces, to join forces on values and to, to be strong players. Each country individual is a very small player and we have in front of us continents. So let's join forces and I hope that despite all the difficulties uh, which I uh, underlined, um, America and Europe will get there ends together. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Vivian. That's a, a, a whistle stop tour from beginning to, to at the beginning of GDPR and looking towards the future. That was just so interesting. And as always, you're quite candid in expressing your opinions and um, ideas, which is 
um, needless to say, refreshing because many aren't, especially people who are have been at the coalface of, of um, designing these important laws and um, seeing how they're implemented. Um, there's a number of really interesting questions here. Um, I, I wanted to just kick off with one, perhaps because you mentioned um, Snowden in the European Court of Justice um, and some important decisions that have been made, and obviously the two Schrems decisions. And I was thinking about how um, at the time when GDPR was approaching the point of, um, of passage and uh, the Snowden case broke, that then influenced the, uh, the quite important Digital Rights Ireland case to the, that went to the ECJ and on the basis of, of their very clear statement about data retention and the controls that needed to be pl put in place to protect um, citizens, that clearly then shaped GDPR and both those elements really pushed forward um, the GDPR we have now. And I've been thinking about how the ECJ, which up to that time really had not been that involved in privacy and data protection issues, um, you know, from the time when you would have first become commissioner perhaps, and then really transformed from the point at which you were the justice commissioner and a vice president. Could you talk a little bit about how you, th the importance of the ECJ now in shaping, um, it, data privacy and data protection law? Well, I, I think that the, the turning point uh, was really the fact that the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, became, got a treaty uh, um, power. And uh, from that on, uh, if you read also uh, the rulings of the European Court of Justice, they always quote the Charter of Fundamental Rights as a basic point. And then, of course, they interpret uh, the European law, which is based on this uh, charter. But from my 15 years experience as a European commissioner, I have always seen the European Court of Justice as an ally helping us uh, when it was politically difficult to put the things in perspective and saying, here is the rule of law. Here is the way you have to go. And political decisions are nice and independent, but don't forget the rule of law. The Court of Justice, thanks God we have it. Uh, it is a compass. Uh, it shows the way and it helps us uh, to bring the corrections where the corrections are necessary. So I am a big fan of the European Court of Justice. Okay, and and sort of a, a very fast question. If you have the citation of the U.S. Supreme Court case in Microsoft, I think that was New York State versus Microsoft. Is that the title for? Um, yes, is that the correct title for that citation? I will find it there, <laughs> uh, and I will answer you because I have the whole. I, I, I might note that it actually, a decision was never made because Congress came in and made a ruling instead giving a, a, a legal framework for those requests, yeah. which I think still it is- It was United States of America against Microsoft. My, my, okay, it's US versus Microsoft, versus Microsoft versus in a case that involved a US was, yeah, That's why it went to the Supreme Court. Yes. And yeah. so the Amite Courier, um, <laughs> okay, and it's okay. there's yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it, 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 it is an important document that uh, Euro parliamentarians from all political groups um, plead in front of the Supreme Court. Okay, and we we have a question on whether um, do you still think the GDPR should be reformed, and if so, how? I know you you had referred you had previously expressed some concern about the operation of the one-stop shop and the, the small Davids of um, the, the big regulator countries, which you have mentioned, Luxembourg and Ireland taking on the might of the tech industry and, and national governments, perhaps. Um, do you still feel that maybe that's something that should be scrapped or are we beginning to see a shift in what else might be yeah. reformed in GDPR? My idea was from the beginning on uh, to have a European regulator. 
the member states uh, wanted to stay with the, uh, a shared power, nevertheless, and have their national regulators under the umbrella of uh, the European regulator uh, and uh, the European uh, regulation. But what I saw in the beginning of the application of uh, the, the GDPR made me very nervous. All this nitty gritty on the football club in, in a village and uh, uh, a parents association uh, in a small town, I, it made me really nervous. And I saw that we had on the, the table since 2016, uh, the big cases and uh, the national regulators were not uh, moving. Uh, and that brought me to, uh, to come out uh, strongly and saying we need a reform of uh, GDPR and we need uh, to uh, give more strength uh, to the uh, umbrella uh, regulator. Um, and I think that was also one of the reasons why the, they started to, to go ahead, because they thought that they could sit back and not do anything and nobody would notice. Well, if they do their job properly, the system is fine. Um, so concentrate more on big cases, on serious cases, help small companies uh, to solve the problem and not find them. Uh, and that would then not need to go to a reform. But if the nitty gritty continues, and if there is not enough power in the national regulators for taking on the real serious cases, then I think Parliament should think about a reform. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'll try to grab a couple of more questions here because I know you need to get a, a plane. Um, one, uh, is, one person is asking, there's international standards um, for privacy such as OECD and APEC. Do you, how do you see these compared to EU adequacy? And um, do you see a way forward for global trade against the backdrop of fundamental differences within the West on an approach to privacy? Uh, well, I cannot see that in OECD there is a unanimity because we are discussing in OECD, for instance, also questions uh, like uh, taxing the tech industry. And uh, so far it was very difficult to arrive to uh, a mutual understanding. Um, uh, I do believe that uh, uh, the uh, member states uh, have taken the step which they needed standard maker and not standard taker. And uh, now it's on the other continents uh, to see if we can move together. I uh, believe that the international organizations are also always of great help, but they are not the movers and shapers. Okay, and um, a good question here. If the commission were to withdraw the data adequacy decision that it has granted to the UK, what might be some of the practical implications on the ground? I'm sure we'll be getting into that in the, um, in the panel discussion yeah. as well, but perhaps your own thoughts on that, whether you think it's likely that it would be recall, um, revoked and well, what might be the implications? Well, uh, it will certainly not be an easy decision uh, but if it really, uh, if, if, if UK uh, would in certain cases clearly go against uh, uh, EU law, uh, then there is no other solution than uh, taking back the adequacy uh, decision because then it is not coherent anymore uh, with the GDPR. Uh, so um, it is not on Europe to decide, it is on the UK to decide where it wants to go. Uh, Europe will take its conclusions which are appropriate afterwards. Okay. Someone's asking an interesting question here about whether Schrems 1 and Schrems 2 were based, it, it, arguing that they were based entirely about government surveillance, the NSA, for example, the issues raised by Snowden, as opposed to commercial issues, um, even though they're presented as having a commercial result for transfers and, um, and is asking, would any effort to withdraw the adequacy decision, um, or they're talking about UK, UK's GCHQ being in a sim similar um, situation, um, any effort to withdraw the adequacy decision would likely be based on that, not on commercial privacy. They're asking is, would that not be the... Um... 
well, situation. Uh, if you if you read the decisions of the Court of Justice, is uh, very clearly uh, uh, not only about uh, uh, it, it has an indirect impact on the commercial uh, uh, handling uh, of questions, and uh, also what the uh, what the the uh, regulators uh, now the fines of the regulators uh, they go against commercial. Uh, uh, decisions. And I must say that um, uh, the Schrems uh, 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 activities have been very helpful uh, because um, there was uh, the lawyer's uh, knowledge uh, put into practice and challenging uh, the right application or the wrong application of European law. So I see uh, this, the Schrems activities as positive and not as negative. Okay, and there's another question here that I think I will refer to because it's relating between um, data between the EU and UK and the North and Great Britain, I'll say for the panel, rather because it's quite specific, but I will, I, I won't forget your question, um, John Glacken, who has asked that question, but I think maybe we'll draw, I know you need to get your plane, um, so we might draw this portion of our event to a conclusion just to say thank you so much on behalf of the Institute and all of us today, because it was certainly a, a, a very interesting and illuminating discussion on both the history and development of GDPR and um, where we might be going and certainly where its chief architect would like to see it going. Um, and so thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for organizing this very interesting conference. And uh, I wish you very enlightening uh, discussions uh, so that uh, also the political world can uh, profit of uh, the outcome of your uh, conference today. Thank you. Thank you, Viviane. Thank you so much. Thank you.